Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Uh, preferences, audio, speakers, internal speakers. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Sorry. I turned the wrong guy down. I was... Sorry. How does it sound? Sounds good. Good. What are you using? Um, 57. <laughs> <laughs> Picks up everything. Even 100 feet away. My children screaming. All right. Okay. You want me to tell you the questions I'm going to ask you? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Sure, I do. Any one that you don't want me to ask, just let me know. Okay. Um, one, how's living in Nashville? Two, who are you currently playing with? Three, how was the John Mark McMillan recording? Four, how was recording at Abbey Road? Five, how did you start playing guitar in church? Six, how did you start playing with Elevation? Seven, when's the next All the Bright Lights record? Eight, how's the new 357? Nine, what does your current rig look like? Ten, how's your new acoustic? Eleven, if you could only bring five pedals with you, what would they be? That was a request. Twelve, who are your top five guitarists? Thirteen, best and worst gig ever. Fourteen, um... The story about that kid that you gave that bass to <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one do you teach your kids guitar okay that's good did you see that somebody made made like a news article about that no you didn't see that mm-hmm. you know you gave that kid a bass right yeah there's a news article about it really yeah i saw an email that the mom sent uh, to the radio station. Yeah. But I didn't see anything else. Yeah, I saw an article on it. Uh, people were passing it around on some of the forums. Really? That was <laughs> that was that Python you bought, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was the best story. It was so awesome. Why were you holding it? Well, just because you just bought it? <laughs> <laughs> We'll talk about it, but I guess it's okay. not just it. But yeah, it was crazy the way it happened. I'm just trying to think of a top five guitar player so I can actually um, have an answer. I'm writing them down. Have you heard Daniel Lenoy? Yeah, man. Lenoir. Lenoir. I just like discovered him on um I saw a rig run down of him. Well, I mean he he's like a he's one of the most famous producers in the world. I'd never even heard of him. He produced uh all the really good U two records. Really? Yeah. He produced Unforgettable Fire, Joshua Tree, um, Octoon Baby. All That You Can't Leave Behind. All those. I had no clue. I'd never heard of them. And, I mean, Bob Dylan, Time Out of Mind, uh, and, and one other one. And then he did, I mean, the first Flowers record. The uh, Wallflowers? First Brandon Flowers. Oh, Brandon Flowers from... He did old Neville Brothers stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, he's just, he produced Willie Nelson's Teatro album, which is so awesome. Uh, yeah, he's amazing. Dang, I had no clue. How do I full screen this biz? There's a little button. Word. Where am I going to put myself? All right. Let me hook 
look up Periscope. Did I tell you I'm going to be in Nashville tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah. No. Hey, before you start, let me go run to the bathroom so I don't have to stop everything and pee. Hold on. Okay. So I'm going. I'm flying into Nashville a day early to meet with um, this producer Aaron Rice that produces the guy from American Idol mm -hmm. that um, I'm going to be playing with. Uh huh. So I'm going to hang out with him for a day, just get to know him, and then fly to uh, or drive to Kentucky. Do you know a drummer named Dango? Mm -mm. He plays with um, like Super Chick and that band Red and stuff like that. I don't know. Oh, never heard of the never heard of the dude. Is that who you're playing with? He's the drummer that I'm playing with. Nice. But he's oh. he's been in Nashville for a while. It, like seems like he knows everybody. Yeah. Uh, um. Are you? Just meeting with the producer. What are you meeting with the producer for? Just to meet him. <laughs> okay. And y'all are leaving from Nashville? Uh, we're leaving from Nashville on Wednesday. I was supposed to get in Wednesday and leave, like drive to Kentucky from Nashville on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. But um, the guy that I play with currently, Jason Bear, he's going to Nashville tomorrow. And so he was like, why don't you move your flight and we'll hang out with Aaron Rice, the producer. Nice. That's cool. Yep. Hold on, I'm writing my guitar players down so I don't forget and I'll have something to say. I've never had a chance to actually go around Nashville. I've only, I've been there for NAMM, but like literally gone to the NAMM show. And then left. Never like, actually experienced it. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Where are you staying? With him? Um, yeah, I'm either staying with him or um, that guy Dango, the drummer I was telling you about. Cool. Or in a hotel. Depends. I mean, we have a hotel, but if we... If the guy, if if the guy Aaron Rice wants us to stay with him, we'll just stay with him. Okay. Sweet man. Well, that's cool. But you'll miss Nam. Is Nam this week? Yeah. Dang, I didn't know that. Th starts Thursday. Oh yeah, I definitely miss it. You're going? I'm just gonna go Thursday. I have a traveling on Friday. Is Elliot gonna be there? Yes, they are. All right, let me get this periscope thing.
Hopefully we don't get any LGBT protesters on here. Why would we? Because last time I did. Why? <laughs> I don't know. It's like a bunch of people just hopped on and they were we were talking about Creation Fest and we were just doing an interview about Creation Fest and like it just like took over the, the conversation so I had to stop it and and uh start over and disable the comments weird yeah i think anybody because it's since it's called the church collective i think anybody sees the word church it's like hey let me see you know yeah let me troll that that sucks are you ready for me to push broadcast sure Trying to get your face in here. What's that supposed to mean? I guess it's cutting off your head. <laughs> All right, got it. Okay. Hello, James. What's up? Oh, 19 viewers already. That's pretty. 20? You attract people. Well. <laughs> okay, so this is Chris Bellamy here with the Church Collective, and we are with the one and only James Duke. Hello, James. Hi. Hi, Chris. Thanks for having me. Um, and we're doing a podcast, but we decided to go live on Periscope um, just to give a little insider's view. Uh Love your stuff, James. You're going to get a lot of comments, so we'll go back and forth between talking with you and then answering maybe some, some good questions we get. So, um, you have recently moved. I have. You were in Charlotte, and now you have moved to Nashville, Tennessee. Yes. So, how was that? It's great. We moved in December me and my wife and my our kids, and it's been great. Uh, we were in Charlotte for probably about 12 years, so it's it was definitely a bit of a shock to our system, you know, leaving family and all our friends and stuff, but it has been a good move for us, and we're really happy to be here. Um, so how did you decide to move? Like, was it music-related, family-related? Um... It was sort of, we just felt like we needed to do something new. We, we just felt like uh, we were supposed to, and we talked about it for a long time and prayed about it, and, um, you know, it took, a, it was about probably almost a year process of um, talking and deciding we're going to do it and putting our house for sale and all that stuff. But, um, you know, I just felt like it would be a good move maybe. And just to be in a city where there's so much, uh, music related things going on all the time. I thought maybe it would be a nice change of pace to be in a, um, to be living in a city like that. So, um, good. So who who are you playing with currently? A lot a lot of people don't really know. They they I think some people still think you play with John Mark McMillan. Yeah. Um, well, I play. I actually just was playing with John Mark McMillan. I did his new played on his new record, um, and then I've been out lately um, with Matt Redman um, and Stephen Curtis Chapman as well. And so those are the main two I've been traveling with a lot, kind of dividing up my time. Cool. Um, so you mentioned you played with John Mark McMillan recently. Mm -hmm. Oh, you hadn't played with him for a while, and you just recently played with him. What was that about? Right, yeah. Well, um, you know, I played with John Mark for years and years. Um, and about three years ago, we kind of decided we would just take a break and kind of 
re-figure out what we're both doing. And um, so, you know, during those times, he, he obviously kept kept doing his thing and I was playing with other people. And then right after I moved here, uh, he texted and called, called me and, you know, said he was doing this new record and really wanted me to be on it. And uh, I said, I would love to. And so, yeah, it was just, it was, uh, it was really nice. We, I feel like um, when we play together, it, it's always something really cool happens. And uh, so it was really fun. It was good for me to be back and hang out with him and just kind of see how he's grown. And, uh, and I think it's going to be really good. It was a fun record to make, live record. So it was cool. So it's going to be out. You, you said it might have video with it a little bit, right? Yeah, they filmed it too. I'm not sure, exactly sure what they're doing with it, but they'll, um, I know they'll at least release a few videos. I'm not sure if it's going to be a full concert film or not, but they definitely recorded it, filmed it. So cool. So it'll definitely be an album though. Like yeah, a CD. full album with him and his wife and some uh, special guests uh, that sang on it and stuff. So it was really cool. It was special, like hometown show in Charlotte in a really pretty theater just to, and the crowd was just super excited and everybody on stage was having a great time. So I think it's going to be a really cool record. Nice. Um, so let's talk about Abbey Road. Yes, Abbey Road. So you got a chance to record in Abbey Road, which is where the Beatles recorded with right. Matt Redman, correct? Correct. Um, when Matt started talking to us, towards the end of last year about his new record, he, um, he said, well, I've thought of a couple of places we could record it because he wanted to do a live record, but he kind of wanted it to be a little different. And he said, well, my first thought is that we could go to Abbey Road and record it there. He said, or we could go to California and record it and you know, find a nice theater or something. So everyone was at the table thinking, uh, or saying, well, gee, let me think, uh, maybe, maybe Abbey Road. <laughs> and so, uh, he, which you could tell you, that's what he wanted to do too. And so a lot of stuff, you know, they had to, there was a lot of negotiations, I think, to kind of get them to agree to let him record there just because it was a live record and bringing in an audience and, uh, but it all worked out and it was really cool uh it it looked they the way they set it up it was in studio one and uh and so they you know it's the long it's the bigger room where they do a lot of the scoring and stuff for movies and stuff and so they set it all up and it looked amazing and they had about 300 people in there as well and it was amazing just being in there and walking around and meeting the people that work there and uh, yeah, it was incredible. So when we talked to Matt Redman a couple weeks ago, he said you also recorded in the other studio where where the Beatles recorded some of their hits too, right? Right, and um, yeah, right across the hall is um, Studio Two, and uh, yeah, so we went in there. And I mean, you can just, you can feel it as soon as you walk in, uh, just, I don't know, it just hits you how much music that you've listened to your whole life has been recorded in there and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and, uh, you know, the piano that they played, let it be is still in there, just sitting there, wow. to, you know, it's not like it's behind a rope or in a plexiglass cage or something. It's just sitting there just waiting to be used and um the celeste which is this little piano-ish type thing that they played the that the harry potter theme was played on uh was sitting right next to that and you know you just look around and you see the staircase that goes up to the control room and you realize like you know i've watched the making of rolling stones like making sympathy for the devil or something and you watching from from up in that perch looking down and seeing them in their little 
partitioned off areas and they, when they're singing and playing and stuff and you walk in there and you can literally just feel feel it you can feel all that music and and it's it's amazing yeah it was a incredible opportunity for sure and just to be just to walk in the halls you know and uh yeah it, it's it's amazing being in there that's awesome um how did you start playing in church like how did you start playing guitar in general and, and then how did you get into playing in church um i started probably when i was 14 maybe I started playing guitar yeah 13 or 14 i started taking lessons from a guitar player in my church um sort of grew grew up with music kind of always being played in the house and stuff my parents um aren't musicians necessarily but uh my dad used to play guitar you know when he was younger and there was always a guitar in a closet somewhere in our house you know and so i remember when i was really young like maybe getting it out getting the guitar out and playing it a little bit but uh, I didn't have a whole lot of interest until I was probably about 13 and a couple of my best friends from church were kind of getting into guitar too and so you know that kind of it uh, encouraged me and I thought well I want to play too and so we actually went and all three of us would go the same day every week together and take lessons like just wait our turn to take guitar lessons from our uh, teacher who was the guitar player at our church and we we just basically thought he was the greatest guitar player in the entire world partly probably because he would kind of make it sound like he was too so it kind of helped um, and so yeah I uh, was grew up just basically in church every time the doors were open you know, and my parents are uh, preachers and missionaries, and so I would travel with them too. So I was just constantly in churches, and we always was real uh, inspired by music and uh, and what what would happen with the music in church. You know, and uh, I started playing in the junior high youth band. At my, at my church when I was probably, well, I couldn't drive yet, so 14 or 15. And uh, we rehearsed every Sunday afternoon, which was funny because we would go to church Sunday morning and then go home, and then one of my parents would have to drive me back like an hour later to start rehearsals. And then, you know, so I was at church all day, and then we'd have church that night. So, But I just loved it so much, and we probably... We didn't even get to play, and it was like months and months and months of us having to rehearse first to where we could actually even all play together. But every Sunday we would just get together and run a couple of songs, and I remember the first time we played in youth group, like the main youth group, and it was it was so, we all felt so cool and uh, nervous probably, but yeah, I, I started doing that and uh, just kind of slowly, I just uh, slowly played more and more. They would let us play probably every couple months, I think. And then they'd start having us play at like Sunday mornings in like an extra little junior high Sunday school thing. And that's basically how it started. Um, it was so much fun and I remember loving it so much and I remember a couple of times my parents would say oh we can't do it today you're not gonna be able to you're not gonna be able to go to your rehearsal and I would just cry <laughs> it's, I was just loved it so much but that's how I started what was your first guitar my first guitar uh my first guitar my dad found pulled out of our attic and it was a old Les Paul copy guitar with a bolt on neck and just I don't even think I had an amp just this little guitar I remember my brother John was playing it one time and it, the strap broke and it hit the ground and one of the tuners broke off 
So I didn't have a, I only had five tuners. And I think for that first Christmas, I got my first, he, I got my, my first guitar and it was a little Epiphone Strat copy, bright white. Um, and so that's what I played forever. Didn't you, you played a PRS for a little while, didn't you? Yeah, I got a PRS for my, a graduation present for my parents. Um, so I played that for a, a long time too, yeah. I think you, people would be surprised, right? You have a PRS, don't you? I have a couple PRSs. Yeah, I like them. Yeah. I think they're great. Um, I listened to a podcast recently with Paul Reed Smith himself, and it made me want to get another one because he's so funny and cool. Yeah. Um, so that that was in Jacksonville, right? Yes. And then you moved to Charlotte. Yes. For what you said, was that Morningstar? Yep. Um, I moved, I had kind of started playing with a lot, with those guys um, for a couple of years, doing a little bit of traveling. They would, and they would ask me to come up to Charlotte and play some, they had these big worship conferences and stuff. That's where I actually met John Mark and, um, I just sort of felt like I had more of a connection in Charlotte, you know, more, and uh, this is really where I felt like, I don't know, I, I just loved being with those guys so much. And so, uh, yeah, they finally, um, I got offered a job there and uh, decided to move on up. And uh, I was basically going up there as much as I could anyway and hanging out with everyone and playing and stuff. So. I kind of jumped at the chance. Is that where you met Jason Upton? Because you played with Jason Upton for a while. Yeah, I met Jason Upton through um, a man named Don Potter. And uh, he introduced us. And um, Don Potter was at Morningstar for a long time. And that's how I kind of started playing with Jason. And then how does how does that... How did you get to elevation from there? Um, well, I met Wade Joy, who's the worship pastor there. Um, I don't know, maybe eight or nine years ago, probably nine. And I had gotten asked to come to Atlanta to play a like a weekend disciple now, I believe, and uh, which is like a you know I don't know if you ever heard of that some weekend thing with church kids and they do do like some meetings and I don't know it's weird anyway uh, <laughs> it's great actually uh, anyway so that's how I met him he I got me I came from Charlotte my brother John played bass but Jacob Arnold played drums and we were kind of his backup band for that and he was living in Columbia I think South Carolina at the time anyway he uh yeah, so I went down there. I didn't know him, and we and we all met and played for a weekend at this Baptist church in Georgia. And I, that's basically all I, you know, I didn't really talk to him again. And then maybe a little over a year later, he um, called me and just said, "Hey, I'm I'm moving up to Charlotte soon, but I've already taken a job at this church called Elevation, and we need a guitar player." for this weekend or something. And um, so I, that's kind of how I started. And I was traveling a lot at the time, but I would, I played, and I think the first time I played there was with Chris Brown. And, um, and so I would play, you know, just a few times a year whenever I could. And that's, and that was basically just maybe less than a year after they had started, or maybe a year, right out of a year. So um, basically since the beginning, as much as I could, I would, I'd been playing there and um, just sort of grew from there. Sweet. Um, okay, here's a question that everybody asks. Um, when is the next All the Bright Lights record? Uh, I'm, I don't know exactly. I just know that we're all 
kind of wanting to make a new record. So I think w I would think we'd get started this year. Um, sometimes it takes us a while to get a record out, obviously, but um, we're definitely all wanting to um, to to make a new one. It, it's just wrapping our heads around it and kind of what what we're what our goals are going to be for it and what it's going to sound like and stuff like that. Trying to get, trying to, um, I'm just trying to kind of get a, get my head around what's next for it and what's the next kind of sound. I was playing um, with this jazz piano player uh, two weeks ago at Creation Fest and he, we were talking and he's saying, just in passing, I don't really listen to guitar players, but there's this this one band. Um, I don't know if you've heard of them, but it's called All the Lights or All the Bright Lights or something. And he's like, I love that album. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I definitely know who they are. But it was crazy to hear, you know, a jazz pianist is really getting into that. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, okay, how's the new guitar, the, the 357? It it's really great. I love it a lot. Um, really, I'm really proud of it uh, and really excited to, uh, that even then I got to do it with Elliot. And um, I feel like it's a really good all around guitar. Sounds amazing. You can, it can sound like a, it has a lot of sounds in it available. Um, it's just so nice it plays so good it has like a good feel to it when you pick it up it doesn't feel like a new guitar necessarily it just feels like a vibey old guitar as soon as you pick it up and it's um it's been really it's been really fun playing it and uh yeah it's great so i know a lot of people think it's a, like a mustang but it's not right uh, differences. You know, it's definitely inspired by uh, the Mustang look. Um, when we first started talking, I remember telling Andy that I wanted to build something based off that, and he didn't want to do it at all because he just thought those were the worst guitars. So I had to do a lot of convincing, saying I don't want it to play like a Mustang. I just want it to look sort of like that. I don't, I don't want the you know any of the stuff you don't like necessarily. I just wanted to be inspired by it. So we uh, I actually took I have an old '60s '66 Mustang and uh, took it there and we kind of did some measurements and basically I wanted the look of one but bigger. Uh, so it's ba it's more the size of a, like a Strat probably, um, but it's. Uh, and it's thicker, so you know Mustangs are really kind of skinny and very thin, and uh, and so this one's bigger, uh, thicker, and just an all yeah all around all around it's bigger, and which is and it's really comfortable, but it's got kind of that throwback look to it, that, which is what I really wanted, and so I would say it's inspired by a Mustang shape, just bigger. Yeah, I remember you were sending me pictures when it was getting built. And I was surprised because every part is literally handmade, right? Yeah. Like even the hardware. Yeah. Uh, well, he makes, he cuts his own bridges out of uh, just blocks of uh, brass, I think. And uh, he cuts his own, even his saddles that come in this long brass rods and he cuts them all down and does all that. And so, yeah, he, most of the stuff, you know, except for the tuners and stuff, he's, he's doing himself. Uh, and it's really, you know, he's got a real, he's got a gift for it. It's just, it, it, I've never played a bad Elliot. They always play great, sound amazing. So, yeah, most of it is definitely in-house, even his pickups and, He's doing all that himself. So the pickups are gold foil, right? Yeah. So it's and different than a Mustang pickup. Yeah. They're still single coils, but they are um, true gold foils. And uh, and so 
you know, the magnets and everything, he kind of, he basically just kind of came up with it himself. And, uh, yeah, that's amazing. Uh, uh, they're really good. They're like, it's a really loud pickup, but it's not harsh. It doesn't overdrive your stuff. It's just crystal clear and super clean. And so, but they're just, they're loud and which is what I really like. I, I always think because I've played some strats for so long, um, a lot of times strats don't sound like what you want them to sound like, or you imagine them to sound like in your head, in your head. And, uh, my favorite strats are the ones with, that are just louder and just those types of pickups. And, uh, these definitely has it. They're great. Yeah, I really like them. And they're for sale now, right? The... No, he he only sells them with the guitars. He oh, has. A... I mean the guitars, not the pickups. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, they are for sale. The first couple are starting, have made their way to the customers, and people are really digging them. Sweet. Um. Your current rig. Yeah. Keeps changing, but what's the, like, what amps are you using right now? Uh, let's see. I have a bunch that I love. My probably my main amp that I'm comp, that I'm usually using is my old Matchless Chieftain. I just keep coming back to that one. Um, and then you know, there's secondary amps if I'm running to the um, anything from a Tyler PT14 to a AC15 to a Bad Cat. There's different stuff, you know. Um, my main amp, though, is I'd say is definitely the my Matchless. It's just played it for so long, and it kind of is the one for me. Uh, so that's as far as amps. That's the one I'm usually taking. And then your pedal board is just changing all the time. Uh. I'd say some of it changes. There's a lot of there's a f lot of stuff on it that never changes. Um, there's always a Dynacomp on it, a Tube Screamer on it, um, Memory Man on it. Uh, there's definitely a few things that are always consistent, just so I kind of know what it's going to sound like. You know, traveling a lot, um, I like to have. I like to be able to turn a couple things on if I'm in a new place with a new amp and I and know what I sound am going to sound like because then I know it's probably the amp that needs to be adjusted or the EQ on something that needs to be adjusted monitor wise or something. And your Dynacomp is modded, correct? Yeah, it's modded and barely hanging on for dear life. <laughs> um. So when you ask for backline, what do you ask for? Uh, usually, the first thing, uh, you know, you give options. First, first thing I want or would like to have is a Chieftain or DC thirty or something matchless, and then it's like uh, Box AC thirty and Fender Deluxe or Twin or something because those are the ones that are normally going to be there. Um, and but that's those are the three I'll ask for because then I don't usually I wouldn't normally pick a AC30 or a even a twin on on my own but that's what everybody has and so might as well cuz I'd get that and be stuck with something else that, but uh those are the three I'll typically ask for and if it if I'm lucky I'll I'll get a DC 30 and then I'll use a uh, deluxe with it or something. Do you run stereo or mono? Um, uh, it's basically mono going to two amps. Stereo out of the reverb is usually how I make it to the amps. So the reverb I guess is stereo. Um, but everything else is just mono. Cool. Um, oh, your new acoustic. You just got yep. an acoustic. I did. What'd you get? I got a J45, and I love it. Is that it behind you? Yes. That's it right there. 
right there. Yeah, that's great. And I would I would ask you about your acoustic setup, but you say oh. you don't really have one. <laughs> no, I don't have one, but I have a nice acoustic now. It's cool. I really like it. Uh, I need to get an acoustic setup, but I just uh, don't I have a tuner. My acoustic setup is my old TU2 tuner and a monster cable to plug into whatever DI they give me. Nice. So you're playing acoustic. You said you play acoustic with Stephen Chris Chapman sometimes, right? Yeah, he does an acoustic set. And so usually towards the middle, he'll he'll go to, he'll play, you know, a handful of acoustic songs, do medleys and stuff, all those hits and stuff, acoustic. Okay. Um, this was a question asked by our contributors. If you could only bring five pedals with you, what would they be? Um, a tuner and a tube screamer and, um, probably a delay pedal, say memory man. And I have two more options. Um, I don't know what else. Uh, I think maybe a volume and a tremolo pedal. Tremolo pedal. I think I can get along with that. Don't really need a tremolo, but I had an extra pick. Oh, somebody's asking the same question. Um, and so no compressor. Oh, uh, no. Cause you run your compressor pretty low, right? Yeah. Like almost just a volume boost. Yeah. Basically just a boost. Cool. Um, all right. Another top five question. Your top five guitarists of all time. Top five. Um, I'd say, uh, I wrote it down. I have, I would say, uh, Ryan Adams is, Definitely top five. I love the way, I love his electric playing and his acoustic playing. And so I love how just gnarly he plays electric. And I love how beautifully he plays acoustic and how he, um, the way he kind of reinforces his melodies when he's playing acoustic and almost like doubles a lot of parts, like kind of like a, the hook of his vocal or whatever he d likes to double a lot and he's just really good at playing to his what he's singing and it's one of my favorite things um johnny buckland is one of my favorite guitar players he's incredible he has a good guitar part on every single song i don't even know how you do that but every single coldplay song there is an unbelievable guitar part and Joe Perry from Aerosmith is definitely up there. Uh, I think he writes the best guitar solos in rock and roll. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, there's a, I mean, just, he's just so amazing at that. And it's inspiring. Uh, Jimmy Page, I grew up listening to Led Zeppelin, and uh, I just love his, how he plays so crazy and with so much emotion and has that blues bass, but also just can jump right out of it, and I just love his feel. I play around the rhythm section and just, it's amazing. And The Edge is definitely probably number one. I love everything about him. Um, best and worst gig ever. What was your best and worst gig? Have you uh, ever fallen off the stage like The Edge? I don't think I've ever fallen off stage. I've, I, I saw him. I watched that live on Periscope, actually. Their opening night in the saw him fall off the stage. I was at the opening night of the, I think it was Elevation Tour, and Bono fell off the stage. 
Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> they had that was when they had like a heart shaped catwalk. Yeah. And it was just a couple of songs in, and, and he just started stepping backwards and just ate it right off the back of the stage. So they seem to do. I don't think I've ever fallen off stage, but I have tripped on stage a lot and fallen a couple of times. But normally I trip and almost fall, which is almost worse, I think, because something, what what is required of you to not fall is... <laughs> okay. uh, there's been a couple of really close calls where I felt like my heart was racing about three days after I, that happened. Slippery stages and uh, when I play with a silent film, they did looms for your in ears because they were hardwired and your patch cable and or instrument cable, and they were in that kind of fabricy sewn up thing. They were both inside one loom thing, and. Uh, I sl I would step on it and then just my foot would just fly out from underneath me and I would almost wipe out every night. That sucked. But worst gig, um, I don't know. That seems that seems like I could hurt somebody's feelings. One time I played uh, at this church and the drummer never showed up. And so. Um, and so this older gentleman that was playing percussion volunteered to play the drums, and uh, so he kind of he sat down, pulled out his phone, and put like a metronome on it, and was like, "All right," and put it on the music stand and just started playing, and it was so bad and mm. really awful. But I mean, I'm not sure if it was any better. If it probably would have been better if we didn't have a drummer at all, but that was rough. I remember just thinking if people this is, I just remember being very embarrassed. <laughs> it was really bad. The best uh, and the best I don't know, Abbey Road was definitely up there. That was really amazing. I'd say that. Because you guys recorded live there, right? That's what Matt Redman said. Yeah, we recorded it live. Like with 400 people in the studio, right? Yeah. It was definitely kind of the best of both worlds because I feel like Matt really is in his element when he uh, is live with people, you know, and kind of leading them. And so being watching him do that in Abbey Road was really amazing. Cool. Okay, so talk about – so you, you bought a bass recently. Yeah. And then there's a cool story about that. There is a cool story. Um, it, uh, <laughs> it, it I, w I probably I wasn't ever really gonna tell people about it because it wasn't it seems like kind of funny thing to talk about. But I was in Atlanta, and um, I we were rehearsing with Matt Redman, and we were leaving that night. Uh, to head to Florida on the on a bus, and so we kind of had a bunch of time off, and we were just sitting around. So a few of us went ahead and went to Guitar Center because so we could get some supplies. And I'm just walking around, looking at a few things, and I kind of happen over to the used section, and most everything kind of looked like um, shredderish instruments or very sharp, at least looking guitars but I, I just saw this price tag and it said $29.99 and I um, was like $29.99 what is that so I walked over closer and realized it was a bass looked like a nice fine bass um, and I thought wow that's crazy and so I picked it up looked at it I remember an employee walked by and I was like hey is this right $29.99 and he was He's like, let me see. And he grabbed it. And I was like, oh, man, he's going to take it from me and change the price. And so I like, kind of didn't let go of it either. I was like holding on to the base while he's like looking at it. And so I got it back from him. 
and John, my brother, was there, and I went and showed him, and he was like, what? You need to buy that. I was like, right. He's, so we went and plugged it in, he played it, I played it, sounded fine, sounded good. Little P bass style. And it, I loved it because the headstock said Python written on it. <laughs> it's really funny, kind of 70s looking font, looks like something to be in a horror movie, you know? And it, it was... And so I was like, it was called, we just immediately started calling it the Python, which is what it is called, Python. And, uh, and so I bought it because I just felt like I had to buy this. I was like, you could have a base for twenty nine ninety nine. I'm like, no, that's the cheapest thing in the whole store probably. Yeah. I mean, base strings cost twenty nine ninety nine. It's like at the very least, these strings are worth that. So anyway, I bought it. Didn't have a case, nothing. Just walked out of the store holding it and, uh. Didn't know how I was going to get home because I was flying home, and and so I thought, well, I'll just leave it with one of my friends. No big deal. So I threw it in the back of the car, got back to where we were at, took it out, and was just like, hey, everybody, look at my new bass. Uh, and everyone's laughing and thought it was amazing that I had bought a bass for such a bargain. And uh, so uh, that night we were leaving, and I was just going to throw it in my friend's car. It's for him to take home. But at the very last minute, I thought, I'm just going to take it with me. And so there wasn't a whole lot of room on the bus because it was kind of full that night. And usually you can just throw it in an empty bunk, but the bunks were all taken, I think. And so I just shoved it kind of behind the couch in the back lounge of the bus against the window. I thought, that's good and that's a good place. And so the next day we're setting up, get all loaded in and stuff. And I thought, I'm going to go get my bass. And so I went and got the bass, put it up on stage next to me. And I thought, I kind of thought I might play it just for fun in a song. So I was like playing it through my pedal board and stuff. So I just had it there. I, I thought just in case, in case I get bored or something, I might want to play it. So it was up there. That, that's why I was even up on stage. And uh, so... We finished up. I never ended up playing it, but I kind of kept looking over at it, thinking, that's a, such a sweet little bass <laughs> with that bass, and I would just kind of smile. And uh, and so I packed up all my junk and was walking to the bus, and then I remembered that I had left it on stage, so I had to go back, picked it up. So I'm walking out with the bass just by the neck in a guitar case and kind of weaving through people on my way to our bus and um, right then this little boy walks by and he said can I have that and his mom immediately was like stop don't don't say that and like apologize and I mean that's so embarrassing you know to have your little boy ask the guy that was just on stage if he could have your guitar but I when he said that, I just, I mean, I was, I realized that's why I had that bass. And so I just said, yes, and just handed it to him. <laughs> and so his parents were like, what? Are you serious? And I was like, absolutely. I want, yeah, this is your bass. And uh, yeah, it was just, I mean, that's basically the story. And they were hugging me and so excited and, it was so cool to think that I found this bass and something it just something caught my eye on it and and uh it seemed like you know such a thirty dollars you know it doesn't seem like a whole lot of money, but that's a whole lot of money to people sometimes yeah. even to me sometimes that's a whole lot of money and uh so it wasn't like that was had anything to do with it it cost money just like anything else did and but the fact that it it was in 24 hours before it was just sitting on on a stand in atlanta georgia and just needing to be delivered to this young boy um i don't know something awesome but i mean just the whole timing of it if i wouldn't have taken it or, and if I wouldn't have brought it out on stage, and if I wouldn't have forgotten it on stage, you know, that would never have happened. I mean, literally, I, he, we crossed paths because of those things. And uh, it was cool. Yeah, it was just really fun story. 
and uh, I was really grateful something like that could happen, you know, it's neat. That's awesome. So I no saw kid to say, can I have that? <laughs> and, you know, no one would do that. Normal. Yeah. So I saw an actual news story about that. Oh, really? Yeah. And it, it, apparently it, the, the story talked about the mother's situation and how they were kind of having hard times. And I mean, she, that like made her year. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I, I didn't see, uh, the story, but I got, she sent actually, uh, an email to the radio station that I got to see. And it was, yeah. I mean, just the fact that they had been going through the worst time of their lives, basically almost didn't even make it into the concert. And, um, uh, yeah, it was just, and it meant so much to them. It was really cool. It's amazing. That's awesome. Okay, last question. Um, so you have three kids. I do. Um, do you teach guitar to your kids? Um, I, they're getting kind of to where they want to be playing a little bit. And so I wouldn't say I've taught them any lessons yet, but... Stetson comes in and he has a little tiny guitar or he'll want to play one of mine. Same with Stella. Stella says she doesn't, she said, she'll walk in and say, I want to, can we play music? And so I'll grab her, give her whatever she wants and we'll all kind of sit around. Stetson, uh, I, I'll tune his little guitar to an open tuning just so when he is just banging on the strings, like it at least sounds like a chord and not not uh you know something crazy and horrible but he he uh he thinks he already knows how to play guitar i think so he's a little stubborn when i'm trying to show him stuff but he definitely knows when it's not in tune and he knows as soon as it gets in tune you can see it on his face he just gets so stoked mm. so I'll walk up and i'll say this isn't right and so i'll tune it up and then as soon as he hears it correct he just smiles and grabs it and takes off you know so they're definitely getting to to where they are. They're kind of getting interested in it, for sure. I have a little harp sometimes that I'll tune up and give to Stella because it's got lots of strings and she'll play it. And They'll sit on the couch together and both play. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it for the questions. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, just talk with us. Um, thank you for your contributions to just worship in general and for giving all of us guitar players um, just inspiration all over the world. <laughs> I'm sure you know that. Um, so, man, you're getting a lot of hearts right now. I don't even know if I want to stop this. <laughs> um, if people don't know, you're on Periscope now, too. I'm on Periscope. Yes. Your Periscope's kind of crazy, except for this morning. You were you were just talking about your new Brady case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to do um, videos with my kids sometimes, or something. You know, anything that I can be a little weird with is always going to be fun too. Night sound checks or um, when I'm playing on stage or something, and yeah, it's fun. A little awkward. I feel like I'm only. I start getting uncomfortable after about 30 seconds. So I'm like, at first I'm like, okay, this is cool. And then I realize it's just looking at my face and I don't like it anymore. So I usually sign off uh, very quickly and abruptly. Cool. All right. Well, thank you very, very much for talking with us. And, uh -huh, sure. Um, I will talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. All right. Well, let me save that. Oh, is there anything we need to do over? No, no, no. It's perfect. Okay. Uh, save the camera roll. My computer is like going nuts. Like the fan is like. Oh, yeah. That's why I, another reason I wanted to periscope it so I could save it just in case the, uh, the um, recording messed up. Oh, yeah. Sweet.